I've seen so many people with good careers inside a company, like burn a lot of bridges on the way out. And if you're getting to any sort of seniority, let's call it director plus, you do not give two weeks notice. It took six months for me to leave Pinterest because not only do I have to like tell people like, Hey, I'm transitioning, but I have to make sure the transition plan works. And, you know, sometimes I have to coach people early in their career about this, like, you know, at Eventbrite, people be like, I'm giving two weeks notice. I'm like, no, you're not like, here's how this needs to go. And I'm not saying this for me. I'm saying this for you. I, yeah. You don't want the CEO feeling like you kind of gave them the bird a bit on the way out. Like I'm still a cheerleader of all the companies I have left. And I feel like most people, should, look, if, if the company screwed you over, I get it. But most of the time, if that's not happening, like you should want to make yeah. sure your transition out is really successful for everyone involved. And that will perhaps make your references even more positive on the outside. Get ready for the Product Tea with Leah, your fun-sized dose of business, tech, growth, and product chatter. I'm your host, Leah, and it's time to spill the tea. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready for the only guy who can claim he scaled Grubhub faster than my last order of takeout. From transforming Pinterest pin boards to SEO gold mines to navigating Eventbrite through a pandemic like it was just another item on his to-do list, he is the growth guru who makes scaling up like a piece of cake, which coincidentally he might just deliver to your door via Grubhub. His blog is called Casey Accidental. Why? Because he's just like his namesake band. He's all about epic transformations. And now he's rocking the venture capital world with 20 Growth VC Fund, teaming up with eight other growth gurus to fuel early stage startups. Imagine having a fund backed by a century of growth experience. That's like having the Avengers of growth on speed dial. Let's give it up for Casey, the accidental growth hero, Winters. Hi, Casey. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. What an intro. Thanks for having me. How much, How would you rate this intro from uh, one to nine growth Avengers? Yeah, it's like Avengers Endgame where there's like 70 different potential adventures on screen. Like, it's pretty epic. That is the correct answer. Yeah. And I hope John Cutler takes note because he actually failed when he was answering this question in his intro, but we're not going to talk about him. He's a gloomy Gus sometimes. <laughs> I will tell him that. Can you introduce yourself to the fools that may not know you? Sure. So, hey everyone, I'm Casey. I like to advise companies on scaling their businesses. So... From an operating perspective, most recently, I was the chief product officer at Eventbrite for three and a half years. I also used to lead the growth team at Pinterest, and I was the first marketer at Grubhub. Basically, from Series A to IPO, I led the demand side. So I used to be a full-time advisor for a few years prior to joining Eventbrite, where I got to work with companies like you know, Airbnb, Canva, Reddit, many others. And now I'm just ramping my advising work up again. And in addition to that, as you mentioned, we launched the 20 Growth Fund to angel invest in, in great companies and help them figure out how to grow faster. And I also have created a few different programs for Reforge on growth and products. So product strategy, advanced growth strategy, and retention and engagement. Yeah, that is pretty awesome. And I also took these courses at Reforge, can highly vouch for them. Even though I think they're coming into the years right now, the, the, the material is still highly, highly, highly relevant, which is very much a testament. And I really, really love those. So let's quickly talk about two personal questions, and then we're going to jump into some of the stuff that you just mentioned. What do people get wrong about you once they do get to know you? Sure. You know, when I get these types of questions. I'm like, oh, I, I generally don't think people think much of me at all. Like, it's wrong to assume that people do have a conception about me whatsoever. I, th I think most people don't care about what I'm doing, but I think in a business context, right? I think some people think I'm very focused and some people think I'm very unfocused. So there's this difference in how people perceive what I work on because of the way people think about focus. A lot of people would be like, oh, you're a growth person, right? Or, oh, you're a product person. And then they get to work with me and then they see that I'm potentially working on like things that are related to operations or culture or, or whatever, instead of just laser focused on something like growth. And that's because to me internally, I'm focused on where there's leverage. I'm focused on problems that have big impact if we solve them. And just so happened that in consumer internet for like the last two decades, growth was tend to be like the biggest problem of leverage to work on. But if it's not, like I'll go work on building a new product. I'll go work on revamping our hiring process. Like it's whatever... I think will have the most impact is what I care about. So I think I'm very focused on things that have leverage, but 
but people from the outside will be like, oh, Casey's all over the place. Like he writes about a bunch of different stuff. He's he tries like a bunch of different things inside these companies. And it's because, yeah, I'm just trying to think about where can I apply pressure to create impact. I think that's a really cool answer. And I at some point we also need kind of still job descriptions that we can apply to ourselves so people have some kind of idea on what they can expect. Sure. But I also kind of noticed the same thing. Like, so I advertise myself also like as a product-led growth advisor in B2B, right? So like... The, 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 Seems pretty focused. The most, yeah, well, kind of. But, well, for scale-ups, it'd be, I'm not sure whether I said that. But the, the point is, if you do that, there's always like this initial reaction. Oh, so you're working in marketing or, you know, like the usual growth garbage that just people are misattributing, which is right. also quite funny. But just like you... I come into a company and then I see a couple of things. I stopped, for instance, also in advising around head of products or CPOs. It always has to go either through the CEO or like through the board or like some, through some kind of executive level. Right. Because in almost every company, there is something broken somewhere else that they said is not broken, which is, <laughs> which is quite frustrating if you just try to implement something and then you don't have buying from the entire company and so forth. Yeah, this was my learning as well when I started advising. I think this was back in like 2015, 2016 or so mm -hmm. was I was a growth advisor back then and I could give you a bunch of growth ideas and you could go implement them and you would grow faster. But then you'd see the company not be able to implement them well because there was something wrong with their product mm -hmm. development process or something wrong with their strategy or um, organizationally, the growth team wasn't set up to implement the highest leverage you know, experiments because they would need to partner with someone else. So that's when I went and retooled and be like, all right, I don't like this growth advising thing. Like, I'm going to help you advise on scale, which includes organizational structure, product development process, hiring, just to make sure that I can point to the right areas of leverage. And yeah, that generally means until you get to public company, you have to work with the CEO directly. Once you yeah. get, you know, working with public companies, it changes a little bit and the executives have a lot more power. But yeah, for early mid-stage companies, like the relationship with the CEO is critical. That is quite funny. Now you're questioning, now I'm starting to question myself whether I should change one word in my title to scaling because I also love scaling companies. Like I find that very interesting, but I, think, I don't think it sells that well. There's uh, nothing like product like we should not yes. invent another word, you know, like product let's scale or something. It's just no, no, no. I don't. Yeah, <laughs> let's please not create any any new buzzwords here. Yeah, if you're focusing on the marketability of it, I would not necessarily recommend what I am doing. But if customer acquisition or building up your brand is is less of a focus because you have a larger network or whatever, then if you have an opportunity to just talk to CEOs about what you can help with, and you can potentially. No. broaden the aperture on what they bring you in for. Okay, let's circle back on this in a minute because I just wanted to get the last question in. Is there something that you are afraid of either personally or professionally right now? Maybe less so right now, but you know, a lot of people were like, hey, you went through this terrible experience at Eventbrite where you know, revenue went below zero. That must have been really stressful. And I was like, no, it wasn't stressful because with, the only thing that stresses me out inside companies is misalignment where you know there are different executives or leaders that are pushing in the opposite direction or, or working against you. And at Eventbrite, everyone was pretty well aligned on what we needed to do to make sure that company survived. So even though it was a lot of work, and of course there was the potential of the company going under, it was you know exciting to get to be able to do that work and to know that even if it didn't work out, we did everything we could you know, to try to save the company. So the things that like scare me or stress me out inside a company is when we're not aligned. And I think Eventbrite's always been very good at that, but at other companies, mm -hmm. less so. And that's the thing that takes years off my life. I can kind of relate to this, I think. Whenever something goes wrong, except for the topic that we're talking about, you know, like, so for instance, I don't know, we want to work out the specific problem that we have in growth and then my laptop doesn't work or whatever, you know, like something on the side that is not exactly about the topic itself. That pisses me off to no end. Okay. And yes. I feel like alignment is almost a topic like this where you're just like, and I, I, I'm not taking myself out of there, right? Like, because we're also in some way responsible where the alignment is happening. For sure. But sometimes you work on something for like two to three months, you have three teams on it, and you just <laughs> notice that they are all working into a different direction or someone that's really important didn't listen, was asleep in a meeting when we actually discussed why we're doing whatever, whatever we're doing. 
And I think I talked about this also with Adam when we were just talking about, you know, you talk about this stuff until it comes out of your ears in a leadership team. But you can bet on it. There's always someone in a company, even if it's below 100 people. There's one guy that has never heard about it because it was just not around or like something else went wrong. And it's just that's where Mr. Lyman is starting to creep in. I've never heard of a company ever say, oh, we are over aligned. We're spending too much time on yeah, alignment. No. <laughs> I think what I learned about that during the Eventbrite experience is, is a couple things. One is if you're spending a lot of time talking to your leadership team and being very transparent with them and all that kind of stuff, that does not mean that is happening at the next level. You probably as a leader need to be doing a lot more work to do, connect with that direct level more, as well as reminding you know your direct reports that they need to be doing the same thing because their styles you know are, are different. Second, to your point about like the one person didn't really hear about it, you know, I think there are employees that will consume everything you've got, internal blog posts, emails, et cetera. They're ambitious. You know, they want to consume everything. And then there are employees that are smart. They can understand the strategy. They can understand the business. And the people that are both, <laughs> they're willing to do the work and able to interpret it very, very well is a small percentage. And mm -hmm. it's worth doing everything in your power to make sure that small percentage are armed with everything possible they can get because they're the ones that are going to create the most impact inside the company. But you also, it also means that in the work to make sure that, you know, ambitious and smart people at the top of the two by two get everything they need, you're going to be like, wait, why does half the product team not understand this thing? And it's well, well, they're not in the top of the two by two. So either they're not smart enough and you probably need to like exit them out or they don't care enough, in which case you probably need to <laughs> exit them out. And, you know, so that's stuff I've wrestled with a lot because, yeah, you think you're saying things like a thousand times and then still like someone doesn't understand it or f says they didn't hear about it, which means you're still under communicating. Yes, but it also means like there might be a performance issue on one or two aspects there that you need to consider also. Yeah, that's very true. So obviously the objective correct solution for any leader that is listening to this is to stand in front of the company and say, guys, you need to care more. And then all the problems are solved. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so I'm um, actually, when you just said this, so you kind of described this, I might actually write an article on this around freemium leadership, because what you just described is the same as the freemium conversion rate. So you have some employees that are freemium users. Yes. <laughs> some of them are trying to abuse the freemium as well, right? Like that can happen. I've had some painful experiences with mishires. Perhaps the majority just during zero interest rate times. <laughs> Maybe. And so, so you have the freemium users, right? But then you have those that are kind of converting into a trial. So they try to amplify your message. And if you reciprocate it, they become really the best fans also. I mean, not of you, but like in an organization right. and they amplify your message. And some of them you just convert to customers and which are, okay, you come into a company and you, you build up the trust, they're with you and they say like, hey, I trust you. So I will also make sure that you will, or like that the messages that you're going to get through the company are going to work. So I like that. Let's see whether this is an actual angle we can write about. Okay. <laughs> I think that will be quite cool. Let's jump into the main topic though, before, before we get stuck on this too much. So in the pre-talk, we briefly went over what you are doing and also like what I'm doing, right? So I guess there's something on top of your head. And I made a note of this where we just talk about this deceleration in 2023. And you have quit your full-time job again in the sense of like you're now in this new phase again where you just should have at least more time. I went through this just a month ago and I would love to talk about this. Can you give us a little bit of context on what led up to this decision? Where are you right now? And then we'll take it from there. Yeah, sure. So for context, I started as the chief product officer at Eventbrite in June of 2019. And I started advising the company a couple of years earlier. So I'd been deeply involved the company for quite a while before I jumped in full time. And I can't recommend that strategy highly enough because you de-risk a lot of issues in, in joining a role when you've just been working yeah. with the team for a very long time already. But nine months after I joined, pandemic hits. When I joined, I knew it was a bit of a turnaround situation. The company was not growing as fast as it should as a newly public company. And I knew strategically as well as operationally, like things had to improve. 
because I've you know been involved so long as as an advisor. But then you know this next thing happens. So instead of things going up, things go the opposite. They go down with the pandemic. Revenue drops below zero, which I didn't even know was possible. And prior to that point, you know, I had been working on figuring out what is going to be the strategy of this business moving forward that can drive, you know, sustainable growth as a public company. And I think what I learned during that period of time, which was probably the perfect amount of time prior to, you know, something like the pandemic hitting, is I think both Julia, the CEO, and myself thought this was a marketplace growth problem <laughs> in that the company wanted to become more marketplacey. I mostly work mm-hmm. with marketplaces and that it needed to grow the consumer side of the business primarily to get there. And, you know, I primarily worked on growth in terms of like the lens, the types of product work you can do. But getting into that role, I, I realized that that was completely the wrong framing. This was a technical transformation role that was going to need new product development to enable new growth loops. Me optimizing the current scale was not going to to move the needle. So you're like, okay, I've not been a technical transformation guy in the past. Mm-hmm. I've also not really been a new product guy in the past, though I definitely have worked on that in, in you know at Grubhub and a few other contexts. So realize this pandemic hits, Julia asked me to write a new strategy for the business Friday afternoon so that I have all day Saturday to write it so we can discuss it on Sunday so that we can go raise debt off of the new strategy starting Monday so that we don't run out of money uh, and have to close uh, the company. So I did write that strategy. I wrote like a bunch of options. Here's the one Mm -hmm. I think we should do. Discussed it with, you know, the rest of the executive team. We were aligned. We did go raise that capital. And, you know, now four years later, company's doing fine. It's been cash flow positive for, for a couple straight years. Great. But at that time, I was like, okay, this strategy that I am writing, I am probably not the best product leader to execute. Hmm. But I am an executive at this company, and it is my job to make sure that we get to the other side of this thing. Like, I've just signed up as a leader, th- throw the compensation out of this, because of course my equity is in the tank, right? Throw the like strategic alignment between my skills. Like, none of that matters. I'm a leader at this company. I need to get us to the other side. So once we did get to the other side of the pandemic, which was, you know, a couple of years later, because this thing kept going on and on, you know, I thought about the leverage that I was creating as a product leader and whether I was really the best product leader for the company moving forward for, you know, like the next three years and had a discussion with my CEO about it. And at first she wasn't too happy with that discussion. And then later she came around and was kind of like, okay, I understand what you're talking about. What would the right leader for this role look like? And how could we still get some of the things we like about you during that process? So we, we figured out a structure where I could stay on as an advisor. And it's a year later, I am still an advisor. But we could also hire a CPO for some of our more pressing needs. And we hired that new CPO in March. And I basically ramped down starting October last year from three days a week to two days a week to one day a week. And you know, now I'm like four hours a week, a year later. So that's the background, sorry, quite a little bit of a long background to how I got to a place of yeah. non-full-time employing because it was like a slow ramp down and I still, you know, work with uh, Eventbrite. And, you know, because I was slowly ramping down, I wasn't going to take another job. I wasn't going to go take another product leadership job. I, I couldn't, right? I still had a lot of time commitment to Eventbrite. And then as, as I started ramping more of that time down, I was like, oh, I'm definitely not taking a job this year. I want to take some time off. No. Pandemic was not great from a health and fitness perspective. Uh, wanted to regain some of that. And yeah, you know, I've stuck to that plan, basically. No. So this is quite interesting. Let's touch on two points here. I think the first one is I have a somewhat similar ish perspective as I also had this kind of conversation with my CEO. But he initiated it actually first. So what we did is we did a pivot into a completely new vertical where I just don't have a lot of knowledge. And it was, you know, like the ACVs that just ballooned up to a one, two million maybe potentially. And right. I'm a product-led growth girl. I mean, that makes really no sense. Even with product-led sales, you just cannot do it anymore. Yeah, hard to put, put in a credit card for that size. It's pretty hard to put it. Well, not just self-serve, but also like, you know, even if you just try to attach behavior or scoring to these enterprise deals, it, it even just like, it becomes really, really difficult in an API business where you just have no interface. And 
the thing that I would love to understand from you is there was some kind of moment when you lay out a strategy and sometimes it's also collaborative and you give your own buy-in where you start to have a feeling, I'm not in this. Yeah. That's the first moment where you're just like, maybe this means I have to say goodbye to it. Can you put in words or just like roughly, was this weeks before you had this talk with her or was this months? Was this days? Was this just like on that particular weekend where you were just like really sure <laughs> and then you initiated the talk? So I'd say I'd been thinking about it for months, mm -hmm. but probably the directness of the conversation was a little bit more spontaneous because, you know, my boss and I had really good rapport. Our one-on-ones were pretty frank. So as the topic of discussion veered in that direction, I kind of leaned into it, maybe a little too much for her liking in that particular moment. But I think I've always been pretty transparent with everyone, you know, I work with. So other people would be like, oh, you shouldn't have been that transparent with the CEO. And I'm like, yeah, maybe. But, but yes, I had been thinking about like, ooh, like I'm working a lot on this, you know, technical transformation stuff. Basically the idea for listeners, right, is like, how do we develop faster when the company hasn't historically had a culture of working no. on technical scale and making sure they can move fast, you know, developer velocity, things like that. And we hired a, a CTO who came in like a year after me, who I was working a lot with, with on this, who had done it before. And, you know, he's been great, but, you know, I hadn't, I mostly worked with startups up until this point. My job is to prevent technical debt from accumulating, not to like get rid of it once it's already been accumulated. So operating from first principles and from his experience, but not really bringing the sort of strategic leverage I bring to other product problems. That was what I felt. So, No. Let me put a hypothesis out there and you tell me whether it's true because I'm fairly certain that it actually is. The fact that you had optionality in your career. And what I mean with that is that, I mean, you're financially stable. You already had some other things and so forth. Made it really easy for you to have an honest conversation about this because I don't think people really realize how difficult to such a discussion is, specifically in the United States. I'm just saying this now because the labor laws are a little bit different than yes. in Europe, right? Yes. Like if I get canceled here or like if I get kicked out of a company for like, I don't know, misconduct, whatever, even then I have like three months of salaries protected. But if we're what, what we're talking about here is, is that you kick yourself out of a job. And no matter how much did you trust your CEO, if this means that you would be landing on the street or you get in trouble because of your personal circumstances or whatever, this is a, this is influencing your entire decision yeah. mechanism. So my hypothesis goes as this, like because you had this optionality, it was easy for you to have this honest conversation also in the sense of the company. And with the company, I mean, not just the company, but also the people that are in there because we care about them. Would you say that this is true, that optionality actually makes you a better exec or like just strategic leader? Because I definitely think so. Because it just takes away this kind of pressure that you have behind, I need to earn my compensation. Otherwise, I'm going to be in trouble. Right. I think that's one vector. I think another vector is culturally inside the company, there's a relationship with your manager and how the company treats these discussions more generally. So I've been at other companies where, and I'm sure you've seen it too, where if you say something that isn't perfectly unwavering in support of your excitement to be there or the strategy. They're like, well, you know, if you don't love it, you should just leave. Like, well, should we end this today? Like, it's just, you know, 100% <laughs> commitment or you're breaking up with me. And if you're in that type of environment, then you want to be very careful about how you communicate these thoughts. But if you have a great relationship with your manager, if the company is a little bit more mature about how it handles these sorts of things, then you can think about how transparent do you want to get or how do you want to propose these sorts of things. So even if you don't necessarily have the career optionality, you know, I had in that particular moment or that, you know, you perceive I had in that particular moment, those types of cultures, you can generally find something a little bit better. So like, for example, when I was earlier in my career at apartments.com, my manager is like, look, I know you're going to get job opportunities. I know you're going to look at those job opportunities. All I ask is that if you're going to take any of them seriously, you let me know before you quit. And, and I'm not like super surprised. And I took him at his word. And when there were a couple serious things that came up, I did let him know. And when the Grubhub job came up as an example, I was like, hey, 
I'm evaluating this. This is why it's interesting to me. And he didn't like screw me over by doing that, right? Like he didn't be like, oh, well, I'm yeah. just firing you. Or he didn't go like alert the CEO, you know, in a way that like would put me in a precarious position. He treated me with respect after he asked me to treat him with respect. So I default to giving that in all future companies. But your scenario may be very different and you need to think about that. I probably would yeah. never be as transparent as I was to Julia because, you know, at that point we had been working together for like five plus years. And even if you have that level of trust and transparency, it's still her company is her baby and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, you have to be mindful of with, with CEOs. And that's where, yeah, maybe the optionality helped me a little bit. But because I had so much trust in Julia, I had trust that like she wasn't going to necessarily screw me over. And yeah. that certainly was not the case. Like, Eventbrite took care of me as I moved outside, moved out of the company over time. And yep. that's what I expected because of their culture. And, you know, that definitely is what happened. I love this so much that you're saying this because I took a note before on another point where I was just saying like, okay, we should talk about this being transparent. But now you made the point really, really well. I think we should still say like, just as an FYI, this is playing with fire with some CEOs for sure. Yes. And I also... So I received the feedback about four to five years ago that I'm too open about the things that I do, also towards the company, you know, like I'm also too critical about strategy in front of people, for instance, and so forth. But the way that I always looked at it is that, look, I can absolutely 100% have a bind to a strategy, but I also want to show people the critical points where this might actually fail and why we or where we are not sure about it and so forth and so forth, you know, like the usual yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. At Small PDF, and I had a discussion about this with Mike Pilowski, my former CPO, I was five months before I actually left, I started to tell him that, look, this is not going to work out anymore. I cannot grow here. So I'm going to stay, but I'm going to also keep you in the loop on what's happening and maybe also get your advice because that's another important thing. Yes. And this was very, very, very uncomfortable. But if it does work out, you suddenly have now someone in your team that when you do leave, this is not just like burning down bridges, you know, like telling someone like, hey, I'm going to be gone by the way next week, right? You will get good reference calls and you will have a relationship for life in the business world, which is so incredibly, incredibly valuable. And this is what made this also so easy for me, you know, like then in the last job to also say that, hey, I'm going to I'm going to do this again. I've tried to dial myself back, but I just can't. <laughs> it's not in my nature. And now I'm too old to just not do it. And I but but I know how uncomfortable that it feels. And it is playing with fire with some people. But if you want to play with fire, then rather do it early so you know what you're up against. Also, in like in a recruitment call, you know, like trying to figure out, should I take this job? Test people, whether they can deal with you being transparent. Don't hide things as well, you know. I think and, that's um, right. Yeah. So I think that's important. I've seen so many people with good careers inside a company, like burn a lot of bridges on the way out. And if you're getting to any sort of seniority, let's call it director plus, you do not give two weeks notice. It took six months for me to leave Pinterest. Because not only do I have to like tell people like, hey, I'm transitioning, but I have to make sure the transition plan works before yeah. you know I can actually leave. And in that case, the initial transition plan just wasn't working. So I was like, all right, I'll stay another few months, make sure we get get this right. And Grubhub was a you know similar scenario. I was there five and a half years. We acquired our biggest competitor at the time, Seamless. We needed to integrate every function. So as we were doing that, I went to the VP of marketing. And I said, look, we need to integrate these teams, leave me out the org chart because I'm not going to be around long term and I'll, I'll help transition my team to the appropriate people, uh, you know, at Seamless. And we worked, you know, through that and found a transition plan. And so if you leave in a way that it feels like you took care of the company on the way out, your references are a lot more positive, your career opportunities from that network go up a lot whether that's advising, like what I'm doing now or, or new, yeah. you know, full-time opportunities. And, you know, sometimes I have to coach people early in their career about this, like, you know, at Eventbrite, people be like, I'm given two weeks notice. I'm like, no, you're not. Like, here's how this needs to go. And I'm not saying this for me, I'm saying this for you. Uh, and generally people listen, but a lot of times someone needs to tell them that. Like, yeah, this is just not the way it goes. A lot of people also get conflicted because they think about negotiation leverage and whether mm -hmm. they have it. And it's not about whether you have negotiation leverage, it's about whether you should use it and a short-termism versus long-termism element. 
So it's like, yeah, you have the leverage to ask for more money right now or to ask for a bonus, but what does that do for you long-term? Does it mean the CEO feels like you're less of a team player and that CEO might connect you with like your next job or you know, be yeah. the reference for the executive job you want five years from now? So a lot of people, they need someone who's a little bit further in their career to be like, hey, let's map out all the stages of this. So if someone does it to me as a more transparent you know, product leader, I'll be like, no, like this is how this needs to go for you. And you know, generally my team would trust me if I did that. But yeah, you don't want the CEO feeling like you kind of gave them the bird a bit on the way out. Like I'm still a cheerleader of all the companies I have left. And I feel like most people, should, look, if, if the company screwed you over, I get it. But most of the time, if that's not happening, like, you should want to make yeah. sure your transition out is really successful for everyone involved. And that will perhaps make your references even more positive on the outside. No. Yeah. All right. So that was for you kind of the deal sealed on the last gig. And I'm sure there were also some personal reasons where you were just like, okay, so what I'm going to do next? As you said, you know, you decided not to get into another job. Yep. And as much as this was kind of like a do or don't scenario, were there other considerations around this as well? How were you feeling at that point? Were you extremely stressed out? Or is it just like, yeah, hey, you know, like I might as well also take, now take a break? Or was there something more serious behind it? Well, because of the nature of how all in I was with Eventbrite to get the company to the other side of the pandemic, and because of the, just the dynamics of the pandemic in that like gyms were closed, we weren't even sure if it was safe to like run outside for a while my health and fitness have definitely deteriorated, you know, during the, those last couple of years. So my main goal upon, you know, freeing up a lot of my time outside of full-time employment was to regain some of that, which I had done, you know, in the past. So I, I knew I was capable of it, but I was definitely, you know, very, very out of shape. So that became my primary focus. And I said, oh, well, there's all these other things because I have a lot of free time I will end up doing. I'm going to write more I'm going to learn this new hobby, all these kind of things. And then I'm going to advise a little bit, but definitely not ramp it up to full time like I was doing prior to Eventbrite. And, you know, then like a few months into it, I was like, wait a minute, I haven't done any of those things. Yes, the health and fitness stuff is working. OKR number one is, is green, but all of the other OKRs are pretty far off. And I had to basically learn to be like, OK, well, this is my capacity mm -hmm. post Eventbrite. I'm not going to be myself up over not being more productive right now. Let me just make sure I continue to crush goal number one. And then if I ramp up to be able to do more than that, great. But you know, we focus so much in our jobs on like maximizing productivity and impact that I had to just say to myself, like, that's not what 2023 is about for me. I need to get this one thing done really well. And if I have time for other things, or if I'm just going to use all that time for more leisure activities, cool. Like that's just the way it's going to be. People have periods of time where they're high productivity, low productivity. And I was just going to go with the vibes on it. Yeah. I think that's quite interesting too. Like for me, that step happened like a month ago. So I'm going to be I'm, I'm a little bit behind you. Eh, it's a bit fresher, you know? And the interesting thing is, is, is that if you, if you would make a pie chart out of this, you know, like, so how much time did, what took what? And I'm not sure it was the same for you as well, but like for me, the full-time job at Jua was definitely 80, 90% of my, at least of my productive awake time, you know, from a classical nine to five job, right? Like, I mean, that was just busy with that particular company. Yep. So I expected when I come out of it, and that was really interesting because it was one of the first days where I just had no meetings in my calendar. I thought, like you, I'm going to do all of these amazing things. And it is true. I had, in this pie chart, the biggest piece kind of fell away, but it only reduced one context in my life. And the interesting thing is, for me, company advising with other companies, even if you just meet someone once a week or whatever for an hour, it still occupies a specific part of your brain. There's just a specific context of a different company with different ICPs, different growth problems that they have. And then you may have, might have this and that. And I think the result for me was that I struggled really hard the first three weeks to just use this additional time because I was yeah. tired as shit. I was so incredibly tired. And in the sense of like, I started to be... I had enough time to start to feel that I'm tired. So I was not doing a lot. 
I was also not enjoying myself. I was not like relaxing, you know, like smoke a joint, sit on the couch and do whatever. Was, that was That's not what happened. Yeah. I was just on the couch and I was kind of, I don't know, I don't know what I did, but I was not productive. I was definitely not more productive. Yeah. Was there something similar for you or was that more like, no, I'm living the life now. This is great. <laughs> 2023, no pressure. Some similarities and some differences. So I didn't feel a sort of, you know, burnout per se in, in mm. leaving Eventbrite. Yes, I dedicated a lot of time to it and certainly some other things deteriorated as a result, my, my physical health, right? But I didn't feel like super drained mentally per se in, in leaving Eventbrite because I actually liked what I was doing most of the time. I had coworkers I really enjoyed working with, all that kind of stuff. I think my realization on this was, uh, yeah, I had a little bit of sleep to catch up on some things like that a lot of, to catch up on, on like being able to run better and work out and all that kind of stuff. I think the learning for me was if you were preoccupying, if you were occupying these, like these 12 hours of the day to work, and then you remove, let's say 10 to eight of eight to 10 of those 12 hours. Cause I was, you know, still doing some advising, et cetera. How were those eight to 10 hour to 12 hours filled in the past was a lot of meeting people, helping them with their problems, some blocks of time for dedicated like IC work. But, and that's what the calendar looked like. When that calendar is just open and blank, well, first off, it takes a lot more time to like run and work out and, and shower and get clean than you think if you're going to block some of that time for that. Second, if you're like, okay, well, then I'm going to have like three hours to write. After like 45 minutes, I'm done. <laughs> like I don't have any more output you know, writing wise that I can get done in that same sort of context. And before I would just switch to a different context. Oh, have a meeting with my product leadership team, have a meeting with the head of sales, whatever. But when you don't have that breaking up your day, that blank calendar is just like a blank page and it's really hard to fill it. And you end up trying to fill it with higher intensity work that you can't do for that amount of time just sitting at a computer. So I found, okay, this time I thought I would fill with writing. My brain doesn't have the capacity to do it. Like I could do it for a small amount of time, but not as long as I thought. So then you do end up filling it with like leisure time. Like you catch up on TV shows or, you know, whatever. And that's fine. Like I don't see necessarily any issue with that. But it, the pie, yeah, that emptiness in the pie chart, you can't just fill with other forms of productive time, especially if those other forms of productive time use like different parts of your brain because you just can't, yeah. I, I can't sit there and write eight hours a day, right? Like I, I never did that inside a job. I will never do that outside a job. But I, I kind of had to learn that, that part of this productivity inside the company was that I got to switch context almost every 30 minutes. And without that switching of context, you run out of steam. No. Yeah. It is interesting because Rob Fitzgerald wrote a book called Write Useful Books. And I was looking into this when I was also trying to kind of figure out, so, like, you know, like the entire process. So, like, how do you write this and how did you do it and so forth? It's a, it's a really good book on, like, how to structure this uh, properly. And there was an interview with him where one of the guys asked him, so, like, how do you make sure that you write every day? You know, like, like on a recurring basis, because there's two factors to this. The first one is I cannot remember. Maybe I've missed one meeting in 10 months at the company I was last, yeah. and that was a mistake. But I'm missing maybe 50 out of 100 meetings with myself when I should stand up for myself. You know, like self-care, like do shit that just that, that I just wanted to do, right? So like it's very easy to commit to ideas to yourself, but you're not taking yourself as important as other people, unfortunately. Yes. So that's the first thing. And he said something really intelligent about this. He said, like, what never worked for me was like structure my day. Oh, I'm going to do it at eight o'clock. I'm doing this. And then half an hour of email answering and then this kind of stuff and that kind of stuff. So what he started to do is he tried to kind of figure out, OK, when were my best days? Where were my best hours of real productivity? So what are my best hours per day? And that's where I write a book. Because all the other stuff, answering emails, engaging in conversations on LinkedIn with other people and so forth, it turns out those are easier to do in the afternoon, you know, like when actually your stuff is coming down, at least for him, at least, right? Yeah. So like what he does is he writes every agree. morning from nine o'clock to 12 o'clock. I'm starting to do exactly the same. And 
this is where I feel like I'm starting to get out of it right now. I'm super productive lately. First of all, I'm drugging myself up with coffee in the morning, which I <laughs> tried to abstain for five months, but it just does not work. Yep. But those three hours, those are my best hours. And it is interesting because people always think like, oh, Leah is working like 16 hours a day. You know what? I'm just work- I'm writing three hours in the morning. That's where I get all the stuff done that I need to do for myself because that's the only time where I have the energy. And then the rest gets pushed back because answering emails, anything that deals with guilt, guilt is a great motivator. Oh, I should have <laughs> answered Casey. Oh, I should have gotten back to Elena. Oh, I should have called back <laughs> to Adam and so forth. These things have another motivation behind. And I think, you know what? I think it actually works. For me, this, works. The this kind of frameworks. I'm better in the afternoon. No. Uh, so the low leverage stuff can happen in the morning. And like, wait, 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 hold on. We're recording a podcast right now. Am I low out leverage to you, Casey? Is, is that what this it is? is? This is purely time zone optimization because you okay, live like good. eight hours ahead of me. But yes, uh, like, and this was the same for Eventbrite, right? We had a team in Spain. So I had a lot of yeah. early meetings for me. So like work just is what it is. You have to work with other people, but no. purely on my own. Like if I needed to write a document or whatever, afternoon for that, for sure. Never, never in the morning, never before lunch, basically, is the way I would think about it. But I could work quite late into the evening effectively, no. where some people are, are just more, I think it's more common to be the opposite. But yes, afternoon is, is my jam for productivity. So morning, it's like, okay, we'll try to like work out. We'll try to answer some emails, do all this kind of stuff. And then after lunch, the real work begins is, is my happy place. But yeah, it is different for different people. Yeah, no, I learned I need to I need to listen to hard rock when I'm getting up in the morning, get some coffee in my veins, and then just like hide myself through the next couple of hours. It seems, it seems to work. So I don't know whether that's a good idea. So right now at the moment, you still have a lot of free time. So people should also constantly contact and bother you because you have so much time and you love <laughs> answering them. But how does 2024 look for you right now? Like just from your current perspective, and I know maybe you don't even have a plan. I don't know. I love doing plans, right? So I'm, I'm not good at following <laughs> okay. them, but like I love doing them. What is 2024 looking for you? Is there at some point where you just say like, hmm, maybe I'm going to go back now into a full-time role because I'm lacking all the context and the material for my blog that I should write. <laughs> so I want to go back into full-time. What is it going to be like? Sure. So when... I left my full-time role in October and started, you know, ramping down. I basically said, okay, 2023 is for me. I'll do some mm-hmm. lightweight advising. I'll continue working with Eventbrite in this new capacity. And then 2024, I'll do another head of product thing. And there were a few reasons for that timeline. One was, yeah, take some time to get fit again in the venture world, you know, all the private companies were extremely overvalued. There needs to be like kind of this resetting of how companies are valued. And then AI was starting to disrupt everything. And in it was not necessarily obvious what part of the stack to bet on for AI, where you would win versus, you know, lose badly, which we could talk more about. So I was like, okay, let's, let's let 2023 play out. I'll understand better the impact of AI. I'll understand better what private companies look interesting again, or public companies potentially. And then I'll know kind of like which product leadership jobs are interesting, you know, in early 2024. And now that we're towards the end of 2023, I'm like, oh yeah, there's no chance of me taking a head of product job in early 2024 for you know, a few reasons. One is that that resetting of private companies, it's taken a little bit longer. There's some great companies at Seed and Series A. You know, there's a relative handful at Series B, and there's kind of nothing else mid stage really that mm-hmm. it looks like if you bet on, you know, joining and got a lot of your compensation and equity, there would be a 10x or higher return. Like, it's just not, it doesn't look realistic. So basically, the plan was like, okay, do a couple of advising things first half of the year, ramp up to a little bit more advising second half of the year, which I did in September. And then, you know, hopefully one of those companies starts doing well enough over some period of time in the future where I could join it full time again, like I did with Eventbrite. So now it looks like I'll ramp up advising even further in 2024 and expect that I'm only doing that in 2024 as well. 
but if one of the companies I've angel invested in or advise is going really well and there is the ideal role for me, then that would probably be the most likely scenario in which I take a full-time job again. Yeah. We'll, we'll see how it goes. This is going to be super interesting, and I'm going to talk about this with Kieran uh, Flanagan in a couple of days again. So we are holding a relatively, I don't know whether it's a controversial opinion about AI, and I think, because something like this, right? So like we think that the impact is going to be far bigger than people think when it comes to jobs, you know, like, and also the way that you're thinking about this is going to be quite interesting in the sense that it is it is undoubtedly going to have a big impact. I think everybody agrees, but it is still at the same time incredibly hard to say like who are going to be the winners. So yes. if you say that, okay, I want to take a full-time job, which usually means you ha you're placing a bet for the next two to three years. Nobody wants to just go to a, to a company for like one year or six months unless you do an interim role. Yes. So let's just get that out of the way, right? It's like the filthy growth advisors like me who are doing interim gigs. So, <laughs> so if you want to bet on this, you're really getting into this position of like almost a VC that is evaluating a business on are they going to not only make it now, but are they going to also be on a good trajectory in four to five years? Because our equity is very rarely worth it while we are there. Yes. We still kind of need to bet on something that has a chance in the future that to also get a buyout or whatever it is. So this is exactly what VCs are doing right now and also struggling with. I work a lot with Notion VC, and I'm not sure how you are already looking at this from your 20 VC fund in that sense. It is extremely difficult to do a discounted cash flow analysis with any business with AI at the moment because you just don't know whether they're making it. It's not the question whether they make money with it right now. It's not the question. We know that open AI is going to make a lot of money. But that's not the question. The question is, are they still in the game in three years? Because the underlying technology is changing so fast. Everything is becoming so incredibly commoditized. And I think that's what people are missing a little bit. I, I made a survey within my um, blog readers on Substack, where I have a relatively high percentage from like executives, senior leadership, and so forth. And I was asking the question, so on a scale of zero to 10, how afraid are you that you're feeling that you're missing the AI train on a personal career level? Hmm. And it was not a good number coming out of there, right? Like people are really afraid. And what I usually tell them, at least from my perspective, having led an AI organization, machine learning, you know, like weather predictions right. and all that kind of stuff, like the, the, the big thing. Maybe you have a disadvantage if you don't understand exactly how an AI product organization works. That is true. Maybe this is not, you're not going to be a technical product manager. If you're not an AI engineer or a machine learning engineer, you're never going to compete with these TPMs. For sure not. But you don't have to. You really don't have to. There's still, most products will be driven by other products that are built on AI, but you might not have to deal with models or any of this. So people are, I think they're freaking out a little bit too much. And I love this approach that you have where you're just like, ah, let's just see where it goes. You know, like, let's just wait yeah. for the next couple of months because we'll know when something good is coming up. I've built my entire career on the internet. I don't really know how TCP IP works. Like I, <laughs> I can't, I can't go rebuild the internet for you. Like, so yes, I think that's true. I think, you know, I've been fortunate and unfortunate, depending on your, on your vantage point, to live through kind of the internet boom and the mobile boom, which I think most people would think about as the two big technological platform shifts of, no. you know, of the last 30 years. And first off, to your point, I do think more people need to think about their careers like VCs, especially if you're yeah. working in tech. Like, can I understand how this business is growing to grow over the long term and become a durable public company where I could 10, 100x you know, my equity. And certainly as an advisor, I mostly bet on equity, but even as an operator, I've mostly bet on equity and I've been able to have, you know, some success doing that. But I find that I think about that more than, than perhaps the average like executive has. So I think what's really interesting about, you know, everyone trumping AI as the next platform shift is I was having this conversation with Sam Shank, the founder of Hotel Tonight, who is an mm -hmm. angel investor in Grubhub. And, you know, he asked me the thing that people always ask every growth person, which is like, oh, are there any new distribution channels that we should be leveraging? Right. I'm sure you've gotten that <laughs> question over a thousand times. And then you times. said TikTok. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I basically disappoint everyone who asked that question, right? Cause it's like, yeah. mm, there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing new. There are new consumer companies, you know, over the last, you know, a few years. And yeah, I explained that consumer companies tend to arrive in droves during platform shifts 
And we haven't had a major platform shift, you know, since mobile. And what Sam told me is like, but I was like, AI, you know, is, is a new platform shift. And Sam's like, look, it's a technological platform shift. It's not a distribution platform shift, which I think is a really interesting distinction because it's distribu- it's new distribution platforms that tend to create new consumer opportunities. We can't go do sales, you know, in consumer. It's too expensive, right? So we need a new platform that allows us to achieve cost of acquisition. And I think now I have a better understanding of the frameworks around platform shifts because what separates a major platform shift from, say, a more minor one like cloud. Cloud, of course, is massively impactful. But as a technological platform shift, like a new way of making things possible, it did not create a new distribution shift, which is new ways of reaching people. So the internet and mobile both did both, right? So you have a new technological capability and new distribution platforms that enable lots of new multi-billion dollar businesses to be created. And when you don't have that, you probably could still make a bunch of great new businesses, but it'll favor B2B, like I would say probably happened with cloud. And, or you can look at something like crypto and it enabled new form of distribution, but didn't fundamentally make new things possible that were exciting to, to consumers. So as I reflected back on going through mobile and going through the launch of the internet, hmm. what I realized is that the technological shift and the distribution shift, they don't actually happen at the same time. The internet came about and then really businesses started to build really enduring properties once Google became a platform, which was like four years later. And the same thing happened with mobile. We thought the app store itself was the distribution platform. It was not. Facebook mobile ads was the distribution platform, which again, didn't launch until four years later. So when people are like concerned about AI, am I missing the boat, whatever, I'm like, we don't have a distribution vehicle for AI yet. We're getting by with, with word of mouth in consumer and B2B, which won't last. Where it, you really need to be jumping in is once you see both the distribution and the technical shift happening. And since AI is only a couple of years in, we shouldn't even expect that distribution platform to exist yet, if it will exist. And to be clear, I'm not saying there is going to be a, a Google of AI but, or a Facebook ads of AI, but I'm saying if there were, we wouldn't have expected to have found product market fit yet. So for me, like, I feel like it's still super early. Like we have a whole bubble, you know, to go through before oh, yeah. we're going to find that. Oh yeah. Which means oh, yeah. if you're, if you're betting on AI companies right now in your career, it's probably going to look like 1999 where most of them don't survive. And then a few that do, like Amazon, et cetera, are going to become incredibly large. So now is a time to learn. It's a time to pay attention. But as both the investor, advisor, and operator, I'm not making a ton of high conviction bets because like, it's just too early. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm sure some smart people have figured it out, but I'm not smart enough to figure out where the right bets are going to be. Let me go a little bit wild on this. So I've talked about this with uh, the VP of product at Intercom, Brian Donahue. Mm-hmm. And I think Intercom has a pretty good grasp on the topic. I would, if there's one company that I would bet on, it's probably Intercom because they have a very, very oh, solid existing companies is different. I think it's easy for you. us to bet on existing companies with distribution to win big with exactly. AI. Exactly. Exactly. Because what they're doing is they're integrating AI. They also know their markets already quite well. They have an existing distribution. Like they don't need to build their brand up completely new or any of this, right? So like this is kind of fine. So what he said is he said that, you know, like we still have a backlog of like for the next three to four years where we're fine, right? Like we're still extracting value from all this stuff. Yeah. The thing that I wanted to tell you, so this is a bit of a wild thought. So let's assume we have another moment where winner takes it all in the sense of I don't know, some chat GPT moment where just people say like, hey, this is not only the best model, but this is also the best platform to just use language models. Let's just, because this is what usually people are also equating with AI at the moment. Yep. So language models, how do I interact with information? How do I find my stuff? Which is a different word for a distribution method to getting new products or like any information. So Let's say that particular platform, and I'm calling it now a platform, whether that's correct or not, is completely besides the point. I get you. Let's say that thing is not using advertisement as a source for revenue. So just stick with me for a second, right? So what Google does is we have 280 billion of revenue in 2022, who is mostly made through paid advertising, which is nothing else than we're going to use the people who are searching for stuff and advertise them shit, right? And then other people are buying into this. 
let's say you have the same platform now, but this is an AI platform, and that platform makes money with subscription, but not these paid ads. The company might still make $280 billion of revenue, but the biggest paid advertisement channel for pretty much the entire world is not as accessible anymore, or it's becoming much more fragmented. So SEO starts to become a problem. I'm not saying SEO is dead, by the way, if somebody's angry in my podcast again. But I'm just saying, like, SEO is going to come under fire. It's not going to be the big thing anymore. It's highly overly optimized. It's not going to be uh, thinking anymore like with just like one company. And yeah, paid advertising is coming under fire. You might not get access anymore to people in the way that you did before. And that's what I think is so wild about this stuff. Yep. This entire shift, just like these 280 billion, they're sitting in one company right now. Microsoft also has some of it, of course, right? But like it is going away. Was that what you were talking about? So, or or so am yes. I a bit wild here? No, for sure. So when you look at the internet platform shift and then the search engine coming about, and there were a couple before Google, but they were terrible. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Alta Vista. <laughs> yeah, it was Lycos sorry. and all this I'm stuff. I'm so sorry. Uh, are they still around? <laughs> maybe. Google... It was a really healthy platform in that you had paid in organic ways to drive distribution to products. And still to this day, they allow you to do both. Yes, SEO is a little bit harder for established industries. You know, you're competing with against Titans who really know what they're doing. But no. it's been a really stable platform for both paid and organic growth for a very long period of time. And then when social hit, people were like, cool, we have the next thing. There's going to be organic and paid. And Facebook's like, maybe I could just get you to pay for all of it. Mm -hmm. And they did. And there really isn't great organic distribution on social networks the same way there is for Google, at least not at the scale we no. became accustomed to from Google. But the paid product works pretty well. So, you know, of course, that's been successful. And I think what every, what Facebook tried before that is they did build an open platform. They built the open graph. They built a games platform. They built all that stuff. And they're like, wait a minute, does this make us money? Maybe we don't need to be giving so much away, potentially creating our own competitors in the future. So I think you've seen the next generation potential platforms be a lot better at pulling up the ladder behind them to make sure other people can't climb their products yeah. to grow. And you might see this in AI. Certainly you will see it if the incumbents win, but you may even see it if startups like, you know, you know, yeah, that, or whatever win. You know, that is the thing. It's just like, if you think about what we are building right now with huge energy costs, like we had a running cost of a couple of hundred thousand dollars per month just to pay the electricity bill of like training a new model. Yeah. There is no doubt in my mind that in five to six years, you probably can train the same stuff on your mobile phone. Just because of how technology goes crazy, you know, like how easy it is to get access to data and all of this kind of stuff. Yeah. So. I am not sure you can actually pull the ladder up, but this is what makes it so really uh, hard. Here, yeah. Here's, here's something I disagree with you on your thesis. Okay. I do not believe when you look at the core internet business models that you can build a Google level company on only subscription. I think if you look at consumer grade companies, hmm. pretty much all of them make the majority of their money via advertising. And then they will diversify into some subscription, some direct transactions, right? But you're either a consumer platform, in which case 90% of your revenue comes from ads, or you are a transactional marketplace, in which case 90% of your revenue comes from buying something directly. And then subscription outside of like Netflix and Spotify, which has never turned a profit, like subscription is a very tiny percentage of your revenue. Because I think, you know, in in tech, we're all like, oh, yeah, we can afford for a subscription to ChatGPT. We can afford a subscription to Netflix, all these kind of things. But the beauty of the internet and having many billions of users on it is that most people get to use it for near free. They get to use most of the products on it for near free. And I don't see that changing. Okay. Okay. Here comes a challenge to your challenge. Okay. This is where it becomes really beautiful. So I don't know whether it's going to be a winner takes it all scenario. That I'm with you. I, I don't know. Like it could be also, you know, like much more fragmented and whatever. But I think we can agree that Google is, the Google model itself is coming under pressure, whatever that means. Yes, it's current business so, model for sure. So do I agree with you that we have fundamentally a lot of companies in the industry that have a freemium model where the model is just like, okay, we're going to annoy our free users so much with just paid advertising that some of them are going to convert into paid? Yes, I do believe so. So YouTube is a very good example of this, right? So like they they recently cracked down. Yep. They just like... <laughs> they got me. Everybody, everybody with, with ad blockers is like, Leo, why does this not work anymore? I'm like, just fucking pay for pro. It's fine. 
Anyways, the problem is, and this is the core hypothesis that we had also with Kieran, a language model can extract value from a lot of products without you ever, ever seeing the interface. I can have a, a HubSpot subscription and then tell the language model to do something on it. Even if I'm a free user, my language model doesn't care whether it sees the advertisements, right? And this is where we are asking ourselves, sure. like, so how do you differentiate yourself in a market where brand, interface, you know, like ease of use, all of this kind of stuff is, is going to be your differentiator? And this is my core hypothesis also behind why HubSpot acquired Clearbit. It's a very, it's, it's a bet on the one thing that you always can defend, which is superior data. Because fundamentally, that's what Clearbit is starting to offer. Yes. So that, that, I think that's a little bit of the wild side here. But I do give it to you for businesses like YouTube, where you actually have to, I don't know, man. Maybe it's also going to affect that. I you really think YouTube know. eventually makes more money from subscription versus ads? That's not what I'm saying. But it will be if it's the only channel to actually reach users. I mean, that's my point, right? Like, so the pressure is starting to shift. So those that still reach free users without language models completely bypassing them, they will make more money. And I mean, then the money's back with Google. So maybe that's the thing. I don't know. <laughs> but like, this is why this is so wild, right? Like, yeah, so this is the <laughs> point, right? So there are certain things that we can bet on confidently based on our experience. Yeah. And then there's six or seven other variables that we just have to see play out. No. And placing a bet okay. early hurts you more likely than helps you because, yeah, just the way they affect all of these things is dramatically different. So paying attention is great, but making a giant career bet feels extremely risky. To exactly. Me. Yes, that is a great point. And this, that was the original point where we said, like, you know, like if you go into a full time position, then you're going to stay for two to three years or in whatever. And that's also seems to me a little bit risky, which goes a little bit against the grain of every uh, hustler on LinkedIn that says like, oh, everybody who's AI gold rush. More. <laughs> yeah. S same no, people that Casey. were like slinging ICOs at me five years ago. Casey, if you don't stay with the company for the next three years, you are going to be a total loser. And that's the, that's the other side of well, it as well. I mean, look, I do recommend that if you're going to go make a bet, like me too. don't leave after a year and a half, like two, three times in a row, like especially yeah, outside of a ZERP environment, that is not an attractive resume quality. Most of us will be wrong about the bets that we do. And that is unfortunately also true. And some of us don't even have a choice. So not everybody's as privileged as we are for sure, but it's going to stay interesting. Well, I, so the macro, right, of how people think about that, just to cover it quickly, is no. people want to understand the decisions you made. Mm -hmm. And if you made an objectively good decision at the time and it didn't work out, yeah, you didn't get the career growth you wanted there, but people understand it. But if you went and joined a company that people thought was obviously not going to work, that reflects on your decision-making you will make inside the company if they hire you. And if you're continually making a bunch of decisions that don't work, which means you have to leave the job in a year or two, then yep. they're going to start thinking you don't make good decisions or you're making good decisions but not dealing with the grit when you actually need to do hard work inside the company. So that's like the thing to watch out for. And so people use short stints as a proxy for one of those two, lack of grit or bad decision making. Yeah. So that, that, but that's the thing, which goes back to what we're talking about. It's like, you're going to bet on AI. Like it's hard to make a really great decision. Yeah, sure. Go join open AI. No one's going to say you made a bad decision by joining open AI, even if you don't make money on it. Cause the, like the equity valuation is sky high. Yeah. You'll learn some stuff I'm sure. Right. But for me, who primarily works with startups, like that company's already too big. Like that's not interesting. No. Yeah. Yeah, I really like this. I think I wanted to also write an article on like a 30, 60, 90 day on how to offboard instead of onboard, <laughs> which is going exactly in what you just said. You know, like, okay, so if I would quit in the next three months, what do I have to get in order also with the company, not burn bridges, you know, like be open with the CEO, sure. just like explain my decision instead of just like, oh, you know, like I'm being gone in two weeks and then I take care of my CV maybe for another one or two days or whatever it is. But uh, yeah, like explain your choices. Think about what you're doing, <laughs> where you are. Yeah, your career is a product, all this kind of stuff, right? Like yeah, you need to explain yeah. your product decisions. Well, so unfortunately we don't have an answer on who's going to be the next big investment. So Casey, this went for over an hour. So I'm very, very grateful. The time flew by. And so let's just bri very briefly, can you tell us a little bit what's going to happen at 20 VC? There was a big announcement of you and eight other great people, except for Adam Fishman, I think. I think you don't like him or like he doesn't like you. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's exactly going on there. Uh, so what's the deal there? Both Adam and I do not take insults personally, which means 
we hurl the most insults at each other. But yeah, no, Adam's, Adam's a good dude. He can give you some okay advice sometimes. No, I've never seen that. He was three times on my podcast. It was never good. You're not but learning your see. lesson. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. So Adam, myself, and, and a bunch of other great growth and product leaders have teamed up on a small fund called 20 Growth. And we're looking for companies to invest in, you know, not really stage dependent. We'll invest in seed, we'll invest in series A, we'll invest in series mm -hmm. B, but we're looking to provide our operating expertise to help those companies grow faster. We're not looking to, you know, lead deals or anything either. So we're just trying to work with cool companies and you help them figure out, you know, how to scale their businesses even faster. We have a particular set of skills within that group around, you know, a different growth levers across B2B and B2C. So for me, it's a really exciting chance to get to work with these great people more closely on the same companies because we usually do not work at the same companies. And, you know, to get to work with really great entrepreneurs, small funds, $5 million, uh, and raised by Harry Stebbings of 20VC who I've known for many years. So he's been really great to partner with. And yeah, just launched it today. I don't know when the podcast will come out, but yeah, just getting started and, and really excited to invest in some companies. Maybe some of them will be AI, we'll see. But definitely not thinking that they all need to be AI or anything. No, no, it's a bomb announcement. It's really good. Like I can vouch for about half of the people on that list already personally. And, and I would also count you to that, I think, you know, because I actually learned from your material. So I think this is a really great fun. Some very, very good faces on there. All right, Casey, should people get in contact with you? Do you want to even hear from people? If so, how? Yeah, look, I just like helping companies. So generally, I try to answer anyone I can that's looking for help. In you know, I like learning about best practices and then sharing them so that we're all building better companies together. So yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. I don't like post a lot. But I'm there. So like, if you reach out, I'll probably respond. I read a lot there. I just don't post a lot on either of those channels. So uh, if you're, you're there, one of those, yeah. If, uh, so you're a freemium user, right? <laughs> I'm a freemium user, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not a content creator or whatever it's called, but I'm a content reader on mm -hmm. those channels. So feel free to reach out. One Case Man on Twitter and then, yeah, just my, my name on LinkedIn. And then I have my blog, Casey Accidental, which I will start resuming content on in the coming weeks. I wrote like three things this last week. But it was, it was a big dry spell there, of like six months of not writing, which again, not going to beat myself up over it, but it is what it is. No pressure, Casey. So when this episode is coming out, Casey has released a fantastic new article, which is going to be readable by you now. So please head over to his blog <laughs> to read it <laughs> right now. Deadlines is firmly established now. Yes, exactly. And that's the end of this podcast. Thank you so much, Casey, for joining me. This was an awesome conversation. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening to the Product Tea with Leah. If you don't have enough yet, you can subscribe to my podcast right now at Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or you can head to my website, leahtharin.com, which is L-E-A-H-T-H-A-R-I-N.com, where you can find much more of my material or just want to work with me. 